My name is Edward Finn. I'm a retired professor of physics from Georgetown University, and I'm also a co-author of a few books, and uh, they've been translated a bit into languages, other languages as well. And uh, my guest again today is Dr. Rodney Brooks, uh, and he will be helping me discuss the problem associated with the fact that there are two ways of looking at the world particles and fields. The particle portion is quantum mechanical in its development, and the field portion is done with the grand theory called quantum field theory. And unfortunately, we're going to talk about this in three different rounds of where the battle took place. And in every case, the particle picture seems to have won. But anyway, we're going to do it. Here comes round one. Here comes round one. Round one started probably, well, a little bit of background. Faraday and Maxwell, they showed that the electromagnetic field existed. All the fields were sitting right out there. And it was really the first time that we understood, began to understand in the classical world what a field was and, and its effects on various things. And Albert Einstein, 1905, one of his Nobel Prize, well, the Nobel Prize winning paper that he wrote, uh, which explained the photoelectric effect, explained the quantum that Mr. Planck had developed and the photoelectric effect it itself. Now, in that process, we began to get particles as living things. The photon, all of those kind of things started to appear. In right. fact, uh, Einstein kind of changed Planck's picture. Planck had seen the electromagnetic field as being spread out fields that existed in chunks, but spread out. Einstein's big contribution, which was another kind of revolution, was to say, these are not spread out chunks. The photon acts like a particle, as you were saying, that goes through space as a particle and is absorbed by an atom. Absolutely. And let me read you a quote of Mr. Einstein's a little later in his life. Okay. The interpretation of the photon as a point-like structure does not admit of an explanation for the interference phenomenon, waves. Fifty years of pondering have not brought me any closer to answering the question. What is light quanta? Isn't that a wonderful thing that he was able to say? Well, and isn't and it, admit it. Isn't it kind of sad and poignant that one of the greatest physics geniuses never, and the, the, the solution, by the way, was, over, was under his nose at the time. And that's another story that I tell in my book, Fields of Color. But I find it very poignant that he died. I have, after all these years, I still don't know what a light quantum is. And that conflict still exists today, doesn't it? Absolutely. You, Would you read this wonderful piece of Richard Feynman's? Richard Feynman was one of the chief people who carried forth the banner of particles. He did not like fields. And he wrote in his, as recently as 1985, we know that light is made of particles because we can take a very sensitive instrument that makes clicks when light shines on it. Light is something like raindrops. Each little lump of light is called a photon. So we have round one here showing that st started by Einstein in 1905 with a particle picture of light, mm -hmm. but we have the, f the quantum field picture of light that Maxwell and Planck introduced. And I would say that particles won. As no question about it. As demonstrated okay. by Feynman's quote. And where if you read most physics books, you'll find light photons described as particles, won't you? Well, and here we go into round two. We're moving right along here. Okay. Is Mr. Rutherford is the person who came up with the real particle picture of the atom. You know, the one that you have in your brain right now, the one with the tiny little particle at the center, which is the nucleus, and then all these little electrons buzzing around this thing. 
and that's the picture I'm sure that, that you have in your ha- in, in your head. I I do too sometimes. All right, but Louis de Broglie wrote a thesis because he had been thinking about this a while, and he said maybe an electron those little things buzzing around, could act like a wave. Because there were serious problems with this Rutherford picture in electrons and orbits, and de Broglie introduced this idea. His PhD thesis was sent to Albert Einstein because nobody believed what this idiot, yeah. but he was a prince, and therefore it was kind of hard. You've got to go and, and ask somebody as bright and as wonderful as Einstein. And Einstein, immediately after reading it, sent a little note back and said, you'd better publish this. Yeah. Well, what happens? Are we have Schrodinger now? We have Schrodinger, all right? He hears what de Broglie has thought of, and he says, of course. And so he then goes to the work of developing a wave equation. And by the way, a really, qu- really quickly, another little Time anecdote. Dependent. Schrodinger was talking to his class, and a student said, well, they're, and talking about de Broglie's idea, and the student said, well, shouldn't there be an equation to describe these waves? And so Schrodinger went back and made it. And, yeah, it didn't take him very long either. No. And here is a quote from Erwin Schrodinger. From the point of view of wave mechanics, the particle picture sh- would be merely fictitious. We have yet really observed such particle paths. So the and essence of round two is this conflict between the particle paths that you could see in a cloud chamber, where you say that is a particle, and this... Or that was a particle that, that went was through. was a particle. Yeah. And the de Broglie Schrodinger picture of it's a field. And who won that? Well, guess, guess who won, guys? It's the particle picture, of course, that came out yes. winning again. Yes. All right. Want me to I'm going to give round you round three. three. Okay. Um, round three is a little harder to describe. Uh, it took place around 1948, and um, physics had evolved, and the beginnings of quantum field theory had taken place. But people were, physicists were unable to calculate some very important uh, results, experimental results involving electrons, uh, because the existing equations ran into calculational difficulties. So the round three uh, battle, you might say, was about calculational difficulties. This problem was solved around 1948 by three different physicists. Two of them took the field approach and one of them took the particle approach. And I'll tell you who won in a minute. The two physicists who took the field approach were Julian Schwinger, the professor who I learned quantum field theory from when I went to Harvard, and a Japanese physicist, uh, uh, Tomonaga, Tomonaga, who developed the same ideas. And I would like to read to you a quote from Tomonaga illustrating uh, the approach that he and Schwinger took to, get, to find a way around these calculational difficulties. This discouraging state of affairs generated in many people, many physicists, a strong distrust of quantum field theory. But after long laborious calculations, he said, less skillful than Schwinger's, note the tribute to Schwinger, we obtained a result which was in agreement with the Americans. Mm-hmm. So here you had this field theory calculation based on fields. But in the meantime, and at the same time, there's this fellow, Richard Feynman, who came along and developed another approach using particles. And the thing is, his approach was so much easier to use. The field theory approach involved difficult equations with Feynman's diagrams, as they're called. All you had to do was cope with particles interacting in certain simple ways, and people could grasp that. Another problem was a personality problem, I would say. Feynman's personality was very outgoing. He was a master communicator. Schwinger was, had his head in the cloud, so to speak. Uh, People couldn't understand him. I sat through three years of his courses, taking laborious notes, 
and going back and trying to understand them. And I'm not the only one. I'd like to read another quote from a Nobel laureate physicist named Yang, C.N. Yang. After Schwinger gave his lecture in 1948 explaining what he had done, Yang said, they went back to Chicago and Fermi gathered a number of physics, physicists and physics students together to try to understand what Schwinger had said. After about six weeks of meeting, several times a week, none of us felt that we had understood what Schwinger had done. We only knew that Schwinger had done something brilliant. So there you have round three. Once again, the particle picture won for the reasons I've tried to indicate. And to this day, people use Feynman diagrams, and even though they pay lip service to quantum field theory, the particle picture of nature won out. That sounds like a pretty gloomy picture. It sounds very much like I know. the particle is the only way to describe anything. Is there any hope? I mean, come on. Well, I do believe there is. Um, uh, having learned that theory from Schwinger and seen how successful it was and how it made sense, that's why I took on this retirement mission of writing my book. And I'm pleased to say that in recent uh, days that this book is doing very well. However, I'm not the only one. I would like to mention that there are other physicists who are taking up this banner. My friend Art Hobson, uh, Sean Carroll, if you can see him on YouTube, talking about the Higgs mechanism being a, a field mechanism, and in particular Frank Wilczek in his book The Lightness of Being. So I do believe the tide is turning, and I think the day, will, the day may well come when the, as I say in my book, when we will abandon the ship made of particles for smoother sailing on a sea of quantum fields. On a sea of quantum fields. That's a lovely way to end this. Thank you very much, Rodney, and good day to all of you.